Today we're joined by Eileen Brown, who is a freelance uh, journalist currently. Um, just came out with a bombshell article, uh, we, which we'll talk about. But uh, Eileen, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, my name is Eileen Brown. I'm an independent investigative journalist. A lot of my work centers on the intersection between the climate crisis and issues of criminalization. And so I've been writing about um, the criminalization of water protectors for a lot of years, including um, at Standing Rock, um, this private security firm, Tiger Swan. Yeah. And the first time you and I actually talked was, uh, I think, at the beginning of the Oil and Water series that was published through The Intercept. Uh, can you talk a little bit ab uh, about that? I know it was a really bombshell uh, kind of series, but also it's it's actually related and referenced in the in the documents that we'll be talking about today. Yeah, yeah. So back in 2017, when I was um, staff at The Intercept, I worked with two other reporters, Alice Sperry and Will Parrish, on um, what became a now 18-part series about um, the strategies used by this private security firm um, to confront water protectors at, Stand at Standing Rock. Um, so our first stories were based on this set of more than 100 um, kind of daily situation reports from this private security firm, um, which described in detail kind of their take on what was happening um, at Standing Rock. Um, these were products that were developed to hand over to the pipeline company, which was the private security firm security firm's client, Energy Transfer. So it really kind of showed, you know, they had a motive to paint things in a very specific way. Um, it also had a lot of indications of what kinds of tactics they were using. So we could tell from the doc documents that they were using aerial surveillance, um, some kind of uh, eaves, like, I, I think, I can't remember what they referred to it in the early documents, but we later learned they were doing radio eavesdropping, um, indications of kind of uh, undercover activities and like infiltration um, and also just kind of a general interest in um, encouraging infighting and exploiting any weaknesses that they could find. Um, so, yeah, so that was, um, I guess I should also say this security company, Tiger Swan, um, was founded by this uh, retired Delta Force commander, Delta Force is this elite special operations army unit, um, and the the company's founder, James Reese, uh, kind of founded this during this private security boom in the midst of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's very much like a product of the war on terror, um, and a lot of the people working there were um, ex-special operations military members. So they were coming into this with um, yeah, a kind of war zone mindset and um, this counterinsurgency mindset that um, was sort of represented the range of tactics used in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so that's language that they use specifically in these documents too. Um, you know, they, um, yeah, kind of referenced the movement um, comparing uh, people to jihadists um, terrorists, essentially. Um, and, you know, again, we, we've, we've been reporting on this for years now. And I think later documents that we got um, showed that they really very directly referenced um, their tactics as counterinsurgency. Uh, so I'll stop there. Yeah, Tiger Swan is the gift that keeps on giving, uh, tragically. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because it seems like, you know, it seems like that oil and water series, especially around uh, Tiger Swan, was sort of wrapped up. Um, and it keeps coming back because, you know, this and, and I want you to talk about this, um, this public records request that the Intercept or while you were at the Intercept, you put in this public records request uh, for these Tiger Swan documents. Maybe talk about that process and and um, maybe just a general overview of what this new trove of documents actually tells us. Sure. Yep. So pretty soon after we uh, published that first story, um, I believe it, I can't remember if it was, I think it was the North Dakota um, Private Investigation and Security Board filed a lawsuit against Tiger Swan for operating all that time without a security license. So, you know, private security is generally pretty underregulated, 
But some states have this bare minimum requirement of getting a security license, and Tiger Swan didn't do that. Um, so, you know, they had argued all this time that they weren't actually doing private security, so they shouldn't have to have a private security license. They're just doing like management and IT consulting, I think was what they initially. Private security is just like, in you know, this is me not knowing much, but in, in terms of these like licensing boards, it's like for private uh, you know, investigators, right? It can be for private investigators. It can be for like people who are providing security at like events, things like that. Is that what a, a private security, like the broad scope of these licenses include? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I believe there's specific ones for um, private investigation versus private security, but they, these boards would cover, um, yeah, both someone like a PI who's really digging into, um, whoever they're looking at um, using like certain databases that only they can access, for example, um, or down to like, I think mall cop type security guards, like people who are just kind of standing there. So um, yeah, Tiger Swan didn't get the license that they needed to. So, but that, that, that raises the question of like, so then what was their, what role did they say they were performing? Yeah, I mean, early on, we saw some records where they were arguing that they were doing management and IT consulting. So they're like, oh, we're just consulting. We're just giving advice about what everybody should be doing. But I mean, based on some of the inter some of the reporting I've done, including interviews and just looking at masses of records, um, my sense is that they did, they were paying people who were kind of standing guard in a very traditional sense. And they were certainly managing lots of, um, very kind of like traditional security guy guys. In addition to, again, like one of their contractors was infiltrating the camps or actually multiple. I think we know of at least three, and this is based on both documents that say so almost explicitly um and uh a ton of additional kind of people reporting um that i did so you know if that's not private security what like what is that and they were they were armed too i mean the i think the more famous instance is kyle thompson um you know he had a i don't remember what kind of weapon he had but it was an assault rifle assault rifle style weapon he you know he was disarmed uh, by a water protector himself so they're they're not just you know, you know, sitting behind computers. Um, they're not just, you know, behind the scenes or, you know, and even the photos um, that were revealed in some of these documents show them, uh, you know, ostensibly like conducting surveillance. There's a guy with like a really long, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, cartoonish, but it's, he's got this like long lens on a camera and he's like hiding, like, I don't know, maybe at Prairie Nights Casino, <laughs> like, like yeah. clandestinely taking photos. Um, so they weren't, they weren't just sort of in the background. They were active, you know, they were active and they weren't, it's not like they were uniformed, you know, but, but, um, it, so what, what, you know, talk about this records request and it, you know, it took two years, um, for, a, I think a judge or a court to actually have these documents released. Um, but yeah, talk about just the general overview of what's, what's in them, um, as you've read them so far, um, but also the process of gaining them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the records request came out of this lawsuit. Eventually the lawsuit turned into, was kind of turned over to an administrative process. Um, so an administrative law judge was dealing with the case and Tiger Swan for a couple of years, I think, kept arguing they're not a security company. They shouldn't have to pay these fines that the security board wanted to issue. They were calling for $2 million in fines. Um, and so ultimately the security board filed this big discovery request as part of that legal process to be like, Hey, look, you're obviously doing security, you know, and they wouldn't have even done that if Tiger Swan hadn't just been doing this like massive gaslighting process of like, no, no, we're not doing security. So they turned over all these records and, um, the security board used them to be like, look, here's you infiltrating these camps. Seems like security. Um, etc. And so, you know, when we found when I found out that that discovery request, um, you know, I got a tip about this discovery request and, um, you know, moved to do a records request. I think by then energy transfer had already kind of stepped in and started freaking out about the fact that Tiger Swan had turned over all these records. Um, they really didn't want them to be public. 
Um, so it turned into this big legal fight um, where energy transfer was trying to get the documents back from the board. You know, they were like, these aren't public records. These are our proprietary things. Give them back to us. So they're going after the board. Meanwhile, the intercept um, kind of uh, put legal pressure on um, the board as well to hand over these records. Um, I think we intervened in um, the the case where the case with energy transfer, sorry, it's been kind of like a legal tangle as happens with these big oil and gas companies. Um, so ultimately it went all, all the way up to North Dakota's um, Supreme court and a judge ruled or the Supreme court ruled that um, these are in fact public records and, you know, the exemptions that exist in the law will apply. So maybe some of them will be redacted, but that's a separate process for now. Public records go through them. Um, so annoyingly they gave, um, an arrangement was set up where energy transfer has a hand in reviewing the documents and deciding what should be redacted. So it, this, you know, this judgment was in 2022, another year went by, which was the board reviewing more than 60,000 pages for redactions, then energy transfer reviewing the documents for redactions. And what we now have is more than 50,000 pages that I guess the board and energy, energy transfer agree on. There's another more than 9,000 pages that they're still arguing over, which, you know, to me is a problematic thing because this giant oil and gas company or, you know, transfer company, I guess, um, uh, has such a, a role in deciding what we all get to know out of this, um, what, you know, a ju or judges have the, the highest court of North Dakota has said are public records. Um, so that said, um, you know, I was initially concerned that there wouldn't be you know, maybe all the interesting stuff would be in the material that was being withheld. Not so. Um, these documents are incredibly, like, rich in information. I really think it's, you know, the most complete picture we've ever had of what um, a fossil fuel company does, the range of tactics they use to go after um, their political opponents, especially when um, there's a direct action campaign, I guess, involved. Um, so on the one hand, there's um, many different kinds of, I guess, I would think of them as surveillance products. So, um, you know, Tiger Swan um, was flying helicopters over um, the anti-pipeline camps, um, flying drones in the area, and they were taking a lot of pictures, which were then going into reports. So we have these daily intelligence updates, um, which are PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentations um, that, you know, I guess they were putting together every day and um, sharing. My understanding is that they were sharing them internally um, to kind of brief uh, their personnel on what was happening. Um, so the slides have images from their um, aerial intelligence gathering which are labeled imminent, which is a very like kind of military state sort of um, image intelligence uh, acronym, I guess, um, or abbreviation. And so they have imminent, they have ones labeled SIGINT, which are uh, describing radio eavesdropping. And you can see actual text from the transcripts of um, the radio communication that they were listening to. Um, you can tell that they were kind of trying to figure out whose call sign belonged to who. Um, they also had slides labeled human, um, so human intelligence, and that would be um, undercover operatives as well as, um, I guess, informants, information from informants that they've developed. Um, so what else? There's also OSINT, which is like op open source intelligence. And that's mostly social media monitoring, which is a lot of what they were doing. Um, so there's lots of uh, screenshots of people's um, social media posts, um, 
Yeah, and so you could tell that, again, they were really interested in any conflicts going on. Um, they were tracking very carefully, like, resources within the camp, like, noting that um, people were having issues with wood um, and having enough wood. Um, you know, the other thing that, one of the other things that all of this intelligence was used for was to develop kind of propaganda products. So... Um, there's indication in the documents of, um, I like kind of, um, tracking of how some of the Facebook pages that, uh, Tiger Swan had set up were doing. And these were, uh, pages that were meant to appear to be by and for local community members. Um, they were really aimed at, I mean, I would say like white people in the Bismarck Mandan area, um, you know, again, if you think about what, what counterinsurgency is, is a range of both hard and, I guess, like soft tactics. So a central idea behind counterinsurgency is that you need to win the population. You know, you really want to get local people on the ground to be carrying out your agenda. And so um, that kind of propaganda was was part of that. Um there's also indications actually more in marketing products that they were also dealing with counter protesters. Um, there was some indication in these daily intelligence PowerPoints that they were very encouraged as, um, you know, counter protest groups emerged in the Bismarck, Bismarck, yeah, Mandan area. Um, like defend Bisman. I don't know if you remember them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, the other set, another set of things that are in there are, um, Tiger Swan's, uh, business development tools. So it's clear that they were kind of figuring, gathering all this information and coming up with like an idea of what the movement was and how it was going to spread. So you see a lot of storytelling in these documents about how, um, this is a movement driven by outside influences, by nonprofits, by billionaires. billionaires. Yes, <laughs> yeah. a lot of Warren Buffett stuff in there. Bill, Bill Gates, Gates. Ooh, which I was kind of surprised <laughs> to see. I mean, Warren Buffett oh, yeah. is always their favorite. But um, yeah, and, kind, you know, referencing people mirroring lone wolf terror tactics and um, kind of uh, giving the sense that there's this thing that's going to spread and oil and gas companies need tire swan solutions, so, you know, lays out the solutions in detail. And, um, these are PowerPoint presentations and memos that were then used to go after the companies. We know we, that they went after include Conoco Phillips and, um, Dominion, which at the time was building the Atlantic coast pipeline in the mid Atlantic. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's more, but I'll just stop there. Yeah, it's like they're I kind of think of it when I was reading it, it was like kind of like a like a wedding planner, but for pipeline counterinsurgency where it's like on your special day, what do you you know, when you're building your pipeline, what do you want to include? How many guests do you have? Right. This is what this is our experience and you know, the, and it was it really was a sort of a profit oriented model, like on their on their end, they're kind of creating they're hyping up the fear, they're hyping up these pipeline companies ostensibly, and even uh, the National Sheriff's Association um, to basically say, you need us because we have a we have a service that you can't do, you know, and it's a it's a very interesting kind of model. And it, it was, you know, I was I was kind of uh, taken back by some of the quotes in here. And I'll, I'll just read one because this is from uh, Chris La Savita. I don't know if I said his name correctly, um, but he becomes like a PR person, I guess, uh, for Tiger Swan. And he's like, he's, you know, he's responding to the, your reporting <laughs> and the intercepts reporting on this. And he's, he's recognizing that the revelations around the activities, you know, were on one hand causing like, you know, paranoia, um, within water, the water protectors movement. Um, but also he was very clear on the messaging that we, you can't say, you know, quote unquote, Tiger Swan is not a mercenary organization. And you, you know, it, it was a point that must be never made on the record, the document says, uh, because, quote, it would be like saying, no, I don't beat my wife. Um, and so the, they were coaching people to basically say, you know, not to say that Tiger Swan is not a military organ or a, a mercenary organization, because 
fact, I assume, you know, there's a lot of negatives, double negatives, triple negatives in that. But I assume that's because it's factually incorrect to claim that it's not a mercenary organization. Because in fact, that's what it was doing, not just at the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, protest, but also, you know, in its deployment in these engagements, you know, whether it was in Iraq or Syria or wherever. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's a very fascinating kind of, uh, you know, twist of how they're trying to, you know, position themselves. And it, it gets back to the question, you know, like at the end of the day, like, I just don't know how this like legally operates, you know, this, this outfit, how it legally operates within the so-called bounds of the law. Like, what is it then? What kind of entity is it other than just a private company, you know? Right. And I do have to correct you, Chris Lasavita. I don't know if he wrote that. We know that he was contracted. He's this, yeah, again, Republican consultant who has now been being like groomed to be um, a senior, have a senior role on Trump's 2024 political campaign. So they definitely contracted him to help deal with the um, with the intercepts reporting. But I'm not sure if he drafted that specific document. Um but yeah, that aside, I mean, one of the things that really struck me when I first do started doing this reporting is that, I mean, all indications are that besides the licensing process, there's not really anything right now to stop um, a company from using these really like deceptive and in invasive um, practices. Like if you're a private company, basically... I guess it's okay to do this. I mean, I think that there are people making constitutional arguments now. So, um, you know, I think that there, I'm sure there might be something somewhere, but so far there's, there's been no like regulatory reform or anything um, since we did that reporting. And so there's really like not a lot that would stop a company from replicating the same practices other than, you know, I don't think that this was a good look for <laughs> Tiger Swan or energy transfer. Um yeah, one thing that I forgot to mention that you touched on um, is uh, the fact that one of the most surprising things in these documents to me, or just something that I didn't know the depths of, was the collaboration between Tiger Swan and the National Sheriff's Association. Um, you know, they were, I mean, we're hoping to get more into this in a later story, but um, they were communicating with Tiger Swan um, quite routinely and... Um, you know, the piece that we pulled out for this story was Tiger Swan reaching out to the head of the National Sheriff's Association and essentially asking for help with their licensing issues. Um, in this case, they were uh, they were specifically asking for assist an ass assistance for um, one of the other security companies that was having licensing issues because there was actually this whole constellation of them working together. But, you know, they were kind of Tiger Swan was managing the whole bunch of them. So anyway, they uh, reach out to the National Sheriff's Association for help. And um, the head of the association was very, you know, eager to do so. Happy to help. There for you guys, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, I think this just has a lot of, I, I think, it's important not to look at these documents as something like historic about a specific event in time that has now passed. Um, the National Sheriff's Association um, plays a role in virtually every, um, I guess, social movement uprising that we've seen in the in recent years. Um, you know, I think that to see that they're so friendly with um, an oil and gas company security firm just indicates that the role that they might play in other places. And again, well, I'm we're going to get more into all that in later reporting. But um, yeah, that was just one of the more striking things in these documents to me. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Kyle, Kirch, uh, Kyle Kirchmeier, the sheriff in uh, Morton County, was actually um, invited to give, you know, presentations on Morton County's experience in policing, the jurisdictional challenges, as well as, you know, the tactical and strategic challenges that they faced in policing uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline Company. And I'm not sure exactly where he gave these presentations to. I know that he gave them to other law enforcement, and I'm not quite sure if that's, you know, the, the, um, the National Sheriff's Association or not. But 
um, it so it does you know it does kind of uh, filter upwards and outwards you know to um, various you know law enforcement agencies throughout the country and like you said it's not just a kind of historical artifact it's it's living probably you know even today in the way that um, local you know law enforcement agencies are dealing with not just um, environmental you know um, movements or like anti pipeline struggles. Uh, but, you know, perhaps in the George Floyd struggle, perhaps, you know, even today with cops, Cop City, we don't know yet, you know, because oftentimes we see these things, you know, we often we only get like a sliver of of the actual like, you know, evidence a lot of the time. I mean, even going back to the days of the COINTELPRO operation, you know, in in the FBI, we, we've only really seen a sliver. And that was just because somebody broke into an office and stole some documents. Um, and that's, you know, that was just a, a, a sliver or a slice of what the FBI was actually engaged in. And so oftentimes, you know, just historically, like you said, it's, it's not, we don't really know the repercussions of it because these are, you know, methods and strategies that carry on to other struggles. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we know that, um, you know, in Minnesota, when Enbridge Line 3 was being constructed, uh, I did a bunch of record, records requests there, and it was clear that, um, you know, they were sharing around this uh, after action report that North Dakota had put together about Standing Rock um, and were really elevating that as this like key document that everyone needed to look at. And that document was wild, too, because they were basically being like, well, you know, we all did pretty great because no one died. It's like, OK, well, if that's the <laughs> if that's the rubric, OK. Um, not a lot of real reflection on, you know, spraying people with water hoses, um, on a, during sub freezing temperatures in the night. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, again, I think these documents reflect a range of strategies that didn't begin at Standing Rock and don't end at Standing Rock. And it's really rare that we actually get to look at how these guys are thinking. So I think it's a real opportunity. You know, I'm really, I'm very obsessed with this story, give it, you know, as you can see with my 18 part uh, series. Um, but I think that it has implications internationally too, because these same um, range of tactics are used in Guatemala, for example, where Maybe there it's ex-military being driven by structures set up during, um, you know, the, the civil war there um, where people were being massacred en masse by these paramilitary groups. Like, what did those guys do after they, um, after the, the conflict, I guess, wound down? Um, you know, they looked for ways to make money. And um, now there's all kinds of fights over dams and infrastructure projects and um, I think some agricultural issues as well. Um, so I think that, I don't know, in a way it was a gift that Tiger Swan was so explicit about turning to counterinsurgency strategies because it really is a useful way of thinking about how mega project security officials think. Yeah. And just to kind of, you know, wrap this part of the interview up it's one of the things that was really compelling to me and I've, i was thinking about this as you were talking is the people you've interviewed um who are the targets of surveillance you know by tiger swan it's it is a very it, cre it is a paranoia inducing uh effect of this kind of surveillance because even by reporting on it and i know there were questions um perhaps that your team entertained around you know what you know what what are we doing you know, because now even Tiger Swan is acknowledging that this is what happens. You know, when you put this stuff out there, that this is what they're doing. It has this kind of, I wouldn't call it a chilling effect, but it does definitely make people who are participants in that movement, maybe second guess, you know, certain things. And um, I was just thinking about, uh, I can't remember the individual that you interviewed, but one of the water protectors was just like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, this makes me just really afraid because I don't know, are they going to pass this on to, you know, the next kind of security firm that steps in like we don't have we don't have an idea of what data they've collected on somebody the methods that they've used like the human sources that they've used perhaps you know undercover uh infiltrators um you know or even just the data that they may have collected through uh you know communications like we don't know um and so i guess 
I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, a question around that, like a, an ethical question, you know, like, how did you all approach that as a team? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I thought a lot about, you know, I think that there's a lot of trauma attached to what happened at Standing Rock, you know, people were in this really like intense situation um, with these like beaming lights on the hill, militarized law enforcement down the road. And, you know, who knows what this militarized security firm is doing. So I really kind of struggled with, you know, for one, I mean, maybe the central question was how much of the documents to publish um, because it's sort of like replicating the, I, I don't want to replicate the, I guess, surveillance and messaging that Tiger Swan was attempting to spread. Um, but then at the same time, I do think that there's a strong argument for understanding what these companies' tactics were. I mean, also, you know, these are real people that are mentioned in these documents that have real lives that continue on today. And um, again, like, I think, the implications are the most, there's potential for the most serious, I guess, effects for people who see their names in there and, you know, react exactly the way that you described. So, I mean, you know, our approach has been to try to get in touch with as many people as we can in advance of publishing, um, you know, give some, give folks some warning as much as we can. Um, and I don't know, be selective. I mean, right now we've just published a subset of the many, many documents we have. And I, yeah, I don't, I mean, we're still grappling with how we'll move forward with the rest of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do think it's been helpful to hear from folks after we've published both this document set and the others. Um, you know, it, it had kind of been a while with this set, so... I was, a, you know, I was a little anxious about it, but so far, most of the feedback I've had is like, okay, this like, from people who really have been affected by what happened at Standing Rock, um, most of the time I've heard this validates something that I thought was, you know, the, a kind of like gaslighting that happens or, you know, um, you think something's happening, but you don't know. And being able to look and see, okay, this is exactly how this was going. I think I hear has offered offered some like comfort to people. Um, and I also just think generally, I don't think that people, I hope that people don't look at these documents and say, okay, well, I hope it doesn't have that chilling effect because um, part of my takeaway is like, yes, they were doing a lot of things that a lot of people suspected that they were doing, but there wasn't the saturation that some some people feared. You know, I don't get the sense that there was, you know, an an infiltrator around every corner. Like what what we've been able to see is that there were a few people that were around sometimes. And you know, I did one big profile on um, this guy who's infiltrating Joel McCullough. And, you know, it was sometimes like kind of silly stuff. You know, he was hanging around the casino drinking a lot. Um, he it wasn't. I don't think that these guys are necessarily like masterminds. So um, I think seeing what they're doing um, and kind of like demasking a boogeyman, it can be. I, I think it's important. And so I feel strongly about, I really feel good about the way that we've approached this. And um, although, yeah, I think that there are inevitably some, um, you know, there's some impact of, of telling a story about um, a company like this. But I'm curious what you think. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most, and this has just been because I've gone through a lot of FBI documents and I've done records requests and I've seen some things and um you know one thing that struck out stuck out to me was the sort of the way that a lot of law enforcement agencies and in this case private security kind of creates this group mentality uh and a way to dehumanize the people that they're 
um, targeting. And, I, you know, you can't really read, you know, you, all you're seeing is just like the evidence of what they've produced. You can't really get into their minds. But it makes you wonder what's going through their minds. And, and is it is it a way to justify what they're doing? Because I'm thinking of that image of the Chungleshka or the, uh, the medicine wheel where they put like a, you know, hammer and sickle, a money sign, um, a religious, you know, symbol. And then um, I can't remember the Oa, uh, bold Iowa. Um, and just like how they were just mocking uh, water protectors. They were mocking indigenous people, you know, writ large. There was no attempt to even, as far as I could tell, there was no attempt to even like do uh, advanced, you know, uh, counterinsurgency in, in terms of like understanding like the culture. Like they didn't even deploy the anthropologists. You know, it was just a complete like dehumanization of water protectors and the water protector movement. It was mocking them. And that to me stuck out the most because it makes me wonder you know, how they operated in these other circumstances overseas and, and the danger in that kind of thinking, you know, um, because it's not, it's one thing to say, oh, like, you, you know, we don't need to provide cultural competency training to private security firms or like Tiger Swan, you know, that's not the point. But what does it mean when they're, you know, they're engaging in this kind of rhetoric internally, you know, something that you might see on a meme chat board, you know, and like, you know, 4chan or like Discord or something like that. But Nothing that you would really you would want you would expect to see, um, you know, amongst people who are surveilling uh, what is ostensibly a peaceful, nonviolent, unarmed, you know, protest movement. Um, that to me is is very fascinating, and it seems to me that they're trying to create an image of of us of people who are water protectors or even indigenous rights in general, um, so that it's it's a blanket sort of dehumanized, you know, one dimensional image. Um, that on one hand, we're not even, you know, we're just controlled by outside, you know, forces um, like these rich billionaires or like even larger nonprofits, even looking at some of the um, the uh, the weird uh, connecting. I can't remember what they're called, like the, how people are connected or something like it didn't make any sense because it was like if you were there, if you knew, you know, you knew who leaders were and the people they identified as, as leaders, it, it was almost as if they were identifying them as leaders because it reinforced the kind of stereotypes that they had, you know, of course the white, you know, funders are controlling this movement. It's not a grassroots movement. And so even delegitimizing the, the actual, you know, leadership on the ground, but even the point of of saying that well they're not even really indigenous this is how can you even consider this an indigenous movement um so it was that to me really stuck out because it got into the kind of cultural element of of law enforcement um of private security and this kind of military uh, mentality about how one dehumanizes um their perceived enemy right and i think in this sense i'm not i'm not trying to like you know give out trade secrets here or anything or like give advice but they're really stupid. I mean, it's, it's really childish and Im immature at the end of the day. Um, and it actually, if I was, you know, if I was somebody who was going to, you know, I would look at this stuff and I'd be like, you guys are a joke. Um, but you're a dangerous joke at that, you know, and that's, what's that to me is what's, what's really frightening about, um, you know, the documents that I, I read so far. So that that's just my, my takeaway. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a lot of like pretty clownish stuff in there and it's easy to laugh at it. Like, I, I don't know, that's a coping me mechanism that I often use, but um, I think it's, you're right that it's like dangerous stuff ultimately, you know, these, this isn't a super sophisticated kind of counterinsurgency, exactly like you said, these are pretty, yeah, they, they weren't infiltrating all that deeply, you know, it's, um, but they're, selling themselves as if they have, and they have, um, you know, access to a lot of equipment um, and a lot of money via their client energy transfer. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's dangerous, um, but not that sophisticated ultimately. So let's shift gears to something a little more fun. <laughs> the last time you were in town in, in Minneapolis, we, uh, you, drag, you dragged me to the suburb, which I've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> um to go to this movie called on sacred ground at a really bizarre I like it. <laughs> <laughs> at a really bizarre uh a really bizarre movie theater there was like 20 seats in the movie theater it was massive but it had like a 
it was like for like it was a very strange setup it was like an open bar kind of situation but there wasn't a bar there so we were just sitting there and there was like i think four other people in the audience yeah us. it was like 3 p.m on a saturday the only yeah. time this movie was screening anywhere in the twin cities and <laughs> the couple of weeks i was there yeah. But uh, we went to it. I'm actually glad I went to it. Um, it, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to like. I'm not trying to like diss anyone who had participated in that movie. But it was a very. It revealed a lot of things. You know. Uh, you know. I said it. I think it said more about, um, like, white people than it did about native people and how they perceived that movement. And and I don't know if you have any like initial thoughts because they they were trying to base some of the characters off of real people. The main character, um, Daniel, I believe his name was. Um, isn't anyone that I knew <laughs> at Kevin and no one I saw, but they had to create this kind of, you know, journalist figure who was a, basically a right wing propagandist. Like he goes around and like delegitimizes, you know, he goes to like places and he writes kind of like right wing, you know, pro pro industry kind of pieces. And he went, he was deployed to Bismarck to kind of, you know, witness the standing, but he's also like a, a military veteran he has trauma he has ptsd from this and then he's like oh these people you know it's like this weird kind of trauma bonding he's like yeah you know i have ptsd you guys have been genocided like we're like the same you know and so there's this like kind of like that's his entry point into infiltrating the movement itself and then he has this weird spiritual and i called it i called it i was like there's gonna be some like did. Some yeah <laughs> spiritual <laughs> vision quest that the man goes on so if you want to see the movie, turn off the podcast right now because there's going to be a lot of spoilers. <laughs> yeah, there will. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I was just maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but it's like the first feature film about Standing Rock and they decided to make it about a white guy's journey. I mean, I guess it's like very typical, but really like this is what you guys decided to do. Um and it also needs to be mentioned that there's a lot of, like, B-list Hollywood actors in here. Like, the star is this, I don't know, I Nick, I don't think that you watched Lost, but uh, he's this, like, creepy character. Like, he was this creepy guy that I think he was, like, not on the ledger from the plane and he showed up. And he's just, like, the creepy guy from Lost. He's the star. Uh, the mom from Titanic is there. David Arquette is the biggest, the big marquee name. I don't know why David Arquette just didn't star in it. Like that's <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he was like, "This is." He's like, "This." Maybe he was like, "This is whack." I'm not going to play this person. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, and the you know, yeah, he finally gets in. It's like this woman, um, native woman, water protector. Uh, see, finds out that he's a recovering alcoholic or has PTSD, and she's like, "Oh." you like we we now accept you and welcome you in um meanwhile they they've also got um one of my favorite characters fish from truth riot um which was uh, a version of unicorn riot had really terrible terrible security practices just like saw this guy and was like hey man what's he up hugs him. Like, that's a very, he's like gives him a hug <laughs> yeah very dude bro um attitude yeah, and um, I don't know. I I mean, I I was I feel like there's so much wild stuff that happened. I guess just I'm again re referencing back on um, my own reporting. There's things that I recognized in the movie. For example, like this guy who is in effect a kind of infiltrator because mm -hmm. he's a journalist. He's going there and he's like, I'm just a journalist, but really he's having these meetings with this like oil and gas guy at the secret fancy restaurant in Bismarck that doesn't exist um, all the time. Yeah, I was like, where did where were you guys eating? I was eating at Taco John's. <laughs> right, like what is this restaurant that you found? It looks nice. Um, yeah, so like at one point, I think at the time that he like bonds with this woman, he invites them to his hotel room to take a shower um, because they've been in the camp and, you know, they need to like take a shower. That was a real thing, by the way. <laughs> yes, no, but that's the thing. It was a real thing. And it's something that one of the infiltrators did. Like in yeah. my big infiltrator piece, this guy oh, did wow. do that. He would like invite people over to like stay. He would pay for a hotel room and like let people hang out and run their mouths. Like, 
you know, and that guy did pretend to be a journalist sometimes. Like there yeah. is actually interesting things that happened that could have been played with in a more compelling way. Um, so I think this film is a real missed up. <laughs> well, the, I think the question that you and I had was like, who's this actually for, you know? And looking at the audience that was there, I mean, there was us. I mean, we were like, I don't know if we were like hate watch. I wasn't really hate watching. I was just like fast. I would not have gone had you not invited me. So that's your fault, uh, first of all. Um, but second of all, like looking at the people that were there, it was like, you know, how, you know, who is this movie actually like for, you know? And and I think of the kind of hero, you know, arc in the story of this guy, you know, he's a right wing you know, it's like the era of like Trump as Trump is around and like he's like in a bar and his like, you know, vet buddies are like, you know, MAGA supporters or whatever. And he's like getting over his PTSD. He's like his wife is pregnant and like their marriage is falling apart because he's just all traumaed out. And, you know, he goes to Standing Rock and he like it's this weird thing because it, it it's like he goes to Standing Rock. He doesn't really do anything for the movement he writes this like piece and um it you know it's it, he writes this piece kind of like exposing i guess and he had like this he found like a an artifact or something at one of the pipeline construction sites so that was his kind of thing but the pipeline still gets built but at the end of the day everyone else gets arrested and then it shows him having a white baby american flags you know <laughs> like enjoying the rest of his life and it was like well, so, and don't forget, don't forget, sorry to interrupt you, but the one of the closing scenes was like zooming in on the baby in a crib and then you see, oh, there's a dream catcher. Oh, yeah. And then behind the crib, there's like a hand-drawn photo of some teepees and it says, home sweet home. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was a pretty, uh, you know, it was just, a, it was a weird film because it was like, well, what's the message at the end of this? You know, it's like, we just like native people just become like, uh, what, I don't know what those things are called mobiles or something like that. You know, we're just, we're just like trinkets basically. And the guy, like the guys, he's like, Oh, you know, had my spiritual journey. He like, it's a really funny, if you, if you watch the movie, like just watch it for the vision quest that he has. He has like this kind of like psychological break, you know, with reality, which, by the way, we should talk about in terms of uh, the other podcast series called um, American uh, PSYOP um, by Wesley Clark Jr. Because that changed my whole perception on this movie. Because anyways, it's a whole other story. But he, you know, covers himself in mud and he like breaks out in a fever because he was like at the front lines. You know, he was getting hosed down by the you know, the, the, the water cannons in the freezing wet, you know, weather, he like saves a kid or he saves that. He like dives in front of someone, maybe that woman, I don't know, like to like protect her from the, I don't know, rubber bullet or something. And then like, they like, he like wakes up and he's like in a teepee covered in straw. And I was like, did not, did nobody have a blanket for this? <laughs> Well, and the scene goes on for a while. Yeah. Like, he's swimming in the womb. He's, like, yeah. looking at himself and, like, pointing at himself. And, like, that woman is, like, in a fire. And it's, like, a very drawn out, um, I don't know, vision scene. But, yeah, the straw, I don't know. Yeah, it was It was just, like, um, we just become a sort of a uh, – we're, like, the magical Indians, you know, like, here you go. Here's your, here's your spiritual journey. Um, didn't help us save our land, but you know, glad you had the white baby and the dream catcher. <laughs> right. He gets along with his wife after that. It really like did wonders for him. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very like extractive idea of what, um, Standing Rock was, you know, and I don't know. Yeah. I guess I, in terms of like who it was for, the only thing I could think about was, you know, maybe they started to make this and that, um, when Trump was in power and they're like, oh, we got to really like connect with people that don't agree with us. And they thought maybe this movie would do that. But I'm just not sure that if that audience is who they had in mind, that they're actually going to watch this. I don't know who's going to watch this, but I mean, I'm glad that I was able to drag you to watch this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, it's good to know about, you know. 
yeah i mean there's a lot there's a lot more to say about it but i mean i think people should if they want to they should go watch it but i i wouldn't recommend it if you if you don't know anything about this movement it's not the best introduction to it no um but it's just kind of like a long list of these you know kind of it's orientalist in a lot of ways you know it's like turning native people into like mystical figures and even our our struggle into this kind of like you know i think a, a lot in the kind of worst elements of um the people who came to standing rock who looked at it as a sort of like this is about me you know and that's kind of really what it is and i think a lot of it's more of a it's more of a in my opinion it's more of a uh a, a, you know a, a representation of like how white folks white settlers like view these things it's about them like how do you how is it that you take a, an indigenous struggle and then center this like white guy <laughs> like, I don't, like how would how do, who wrote that script you know that's that's my question yeah. but yeah but it also gets to a you know a question about like you know we I think I don't know how much you listened to it, um, but we did listen to the uh, American PSYOP uh, oh, podcast by it. Wesley yeah. Clark Jr. And we should do a podcast episode on that because um, that was pretty interesting. I mean, this he admits I mean, I, I'm not giving away any kind of like spoilers because it's in the first episode, but he admits he has a psychological break with reality and actually can't find what's real and what's not, you know, and he's um a veteran he believes that he's kind of this messianic figure uh who he believes he's the archangel metacon metacom metacon i can't remember what metatron metatron that's what it was metatron, yeah yeah and he's like being deployed to standing rock to you know participate in this rapture kind of end of the world you know apocalypse event um but along the way he you know or later on he's convinced he's convinced himself i believe that he was part of some kind of like American psychological operation mm -hmm. to get him to, you know, participate not just in Standing Rock but a whole whole series of different events. And I there's think there's, cult. yeah, there's a there's a cult that allegedly surrounds him to convince him to do these things. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Listen to that the same weekend we saw that movie. So. <laughs> yeah. Lot. Yeah, thanks for uh, sending me down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for you. <laughs> you're like, you're like the people. Like, uh, there's people in my life that are like, "Hey, you want to see something really effed up?" And I'm like, "Not really. I just kind of like living my life here." <laughs> I mean, but come on. you're not. I'm glad. I, I'm right? glad I saw the movie and listened to the podcast because it, it gave me an insight that I didn't. I guess I didn't have, but I appreciate right. it. Exactly. But, um, well, I think that's uh, you know that wraps us up. I don't know if you have any, you know. Anything you want to plug right now? Uh, any projects? Or I'm sure there's few, more future reporting coming out of this trove of documents. Um, when can we expect, um, you know, the next the next uh, slice of this very juicy and salacious story? <laughs> um, as soon as we can get it together to put it out there, um, you know, there's like, yeah, there will be a lot more reporting on this document set. Um, we're thinking through how to get it out there um yeah so definitely stay tuned i think yeah there's it's very rich with information and we'll have more to share as soon as we can and where can people find your work um people can find my work on my website eileenbrown.com um i post things on twitter at eileen brown um yeah these stories this story was a partnership between the intercept and grist so folks can find it there um but yeah also on my website 